concealed. If the lion didn't have a name, do you think we'd have this outcry? We're taking you to ground zero, where it really happened. The only American journalist there on the ground in Zimbabwe. This is Cecil's kingdom, all of this. As the sun goes down, their hunting bows go up, and a 15-hour dance of death begins. They use that food to bait him across these tracks and over into private property. A lure, then a light. A spotlight would have come on. He can't see you. You've brought this animal to you, delivered to you like a pizza. <laughs> Disgusting. It's shameful. What he looks like now. And was there a cover-up? All new details about the lion's GPS, from the first outsider to discover the kill. Someone has moved the collar in this big rotation, so it looks like the lion is alive. Tonight, we're taking you on the search for Dr. Palmer as the hunter becomes the hunted and the hated. Is it that difficult for you to get an erection that you need to kill things? Both say they didn't know they were killing Cecil. Yeah. Do you believe that? But this hunter is not in hiding. The woman in that notorious photo that set Twitter on fire, yeah, I've got talking only to 2020 in her first television interview. You're one of the most hated women in the world. Does that bother you? How she says hunting animals will save them. Oh my gosh, look at him! That money goes directly back into the conservation. I love animals. I don't understand any level of, I love you, I think you're awesome, should I kill you? Tonight, from the wilds of Africa to the wild west of America, our correspondents take you into a hidden world you've never seen. If you could say one thing to Dr. Walter Palmer, what would you say to him? After tonight, what would you say? On these sweeping plains, one of the planet's most fearsome predators was born. <laughs> destined to take his place atop the food chain. And one day, the whole world would know his name, Cecil. So Cecil would have been born in a litter, typically three or five uh, cubs in a litter. They're still blind. They're completely vulnerable. They're licking, they're bonding. Mum comes in and gives them that protection. And that's where this pride idea develops in lions. We came to the place Cecil called home, Zimbabwe, a country blessed with a wealth of natural resources and cursed with decades of misrule and economic stagnation. And here, just over a hundred miles from the breathtaking Victoria Falls, we arrive at Wangay National Park, a vast preserve the size of Connecticut where Cecil lived. His neighbors included these giraffes, zebras, and elephants. Look at the size of this guy. We've got a front row seat today to one of the most amazing sights you'll ever see. A group of about 50 elephants stopping by for a drink. Incredible. But don't let the pretty pictures deceive you. As our guide Dudley explained, this place may be beautiful. He's standing here, I'm talking to you. On the other side there you get animals coming and sometimes you get surrounded with animals that you can't even make it to the car. But it can also be deadly. You see what I was saying? Yeah. You see what I was saying? Wow. Guys, I think we have to move. Eh? Okay. There's more elephants coming, there, guys. Okay, let's move. Okay, let's move over. Shh, 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 shh. Mark, come here quickly, guys. Quickly, quickly, follow me. We were lucky to make it, and Cecil was too. At least 67% of lion cubs don't make it to adulthood, dying of starvation, disease, or infanticide when the new males take over the pride. But Cecil survives and thrives, a triumph of biology. By his first birthday, his first roar. By his third, he starts asserting himself. That's him on the prowl. Large in size and stature, demanding a bigger share of the pride's kill. The dominant males most likely kicking him out and on his own. He's much bigger than a lioness now, and he's dominating things at a carcass. Would he have been a big guy from a young age based on how you saw him? Yeah, absolutely. And at one point, he decides it's enough is enough, he must go out on his own. Brent Staple Camp is the closest thing we have to a Cecil biographer. A lion researcher with Oxford University, Staple Camp fitted Cecil with a tracking collar in 2008 and has studied his movements ever since. And now you scan, and you get that, uh, that sort of noise in the background, but there's a very faint beep. I think he's in that direction now. For the next few years, Cecil roams terrain where only the strong survive. 
fighting for food and a pride of his own. And note this special feature, that distinctive black mane, known to friend and foe alike. The darkness correlates to a lion's strength and vigor. Plus, the lionesses love it. What's the significance of that black mane? The females will actually select for black maned lions and give them more mating rights than the blonde counterpart. A big black maned lion and just knows that he's the, he's the boss. Then, a development no one expected. Cecil forms an unlikely alliance with the son of a pride leader he once killed, a lion named Jericho, who would play a larger role later. We get a message from a safari camp to say, Brent, we've got Cecil and Jericho together. They're fighting, but they're together. Two days, three days later, they're seen walking together. There's photographs from, of them rubbing heads and things. The lions scratch and claw their way to the top, their own pride, and Cecil becoming the king of the largest kingdom in the park. Oh my God, get him. But the menacing top cat in the land has another surprising role in the park, that of a camera-ready superstar. Cecil was very relaxed and everyone could take picture of him close to the vehicle. The other lines that you would see here, you get close to them, they'll run away. CC was so used, maybe he was camera addicted. In a country suffering with both economic and political turmoil, Cecil was one of the few bright spots here. He helped bring in millions to the tourism industry. Thousands would come from around the world just to see him. His full black mane, a symbol of strength and power. He just used to strut and, and show off, and he was, he really was, um, famous because of, of the way he interacted with um, with people. Sounds almost regal. Very regal. Yeah, yeah he was he was a, a, a big Zimbabwean iconic animal. Sharon Stead grew up here. Her family operating safari lodges for the past 25 years. Have you ever caught him when he's pissed off? Yeah, he came out of one of the bushes um, just close by here once before, and um, with a big roar and, and, and you know how they, they they throw sand on the you know on the ground to make them think that make you think that they're really. Wait, um, he roared at you? Yeah, like, like like I can't make the real noise, but that's how they they make it. What yeah. did you do? Well, your heart stops, <laughs> and you think, is he gonna stop? Brent saw the lion's softer side. And I just remember watching this lion with his pride, and this was 20 lions eating an elephant, cubs leaving the carcass to go and rub up against dad, back to the carcass, lioness is doing the same. Eventually he came to the carcass, had his fill, and then he fell asleep with his head on. <laughs> so I've got photographs of him with his head on the elephant, just fast asleep. Just passed out, comfortable. And I think, I've had my fill. Yeah, that's Cecil, you know. I've done my bit, I've got my family around me. So beautiful. After 13 years, Cecil is enjoying life as a real-life Lion King. But as the sun sets in Wangay Park on July 1st, time is running out for the beast with the signature black mane. Coming up, the king of the jungle is about to learn he's not the top predator on the planet. Stay with us. We continue with 2020's Hunter and Hunted. Here now, Deborah Roberts. On these sweeping plains, one of the planet's most fearsome predators was born, destined to take his place atop the food chain. And one day, the whole world would know his name, Walter Palmer. Going back in time. This is me, this is Walt. Chad Wagner played basketball with Walter Palmer back when they were both boys at Lisbon High School in North Dakota. It's Walt on a jump shot. Palmer, the sharp shooting forward. Wagner, the team captain and lifelong friend. The type of guy that would give you the shirt off his back when in need. He would be the type of guy to help anybody. Lisbon is a farming community of about 2,000 people. Walter grew up with a brother and sister in this attractive ranch-style home, just walking distance from the main street in town. His family were very well liked. His dad was a doctor. Obviously, being a doctor in town, you're one of the most important, uh, prominent people in town. This is typical North Dakota. Now we're heading out into more dryland territory where you'd see more wildlife. 
Chad showed us the fields where as youngsters he and Walter would hunt pheasant, geese, and white-tailed deer. About as quiet and desolate as you come. We had a lot of good times up here. Back at school, Chad says Walter stood out, an honor student and class leader. Folks here weren't surprised he followed his dad into medicine, eventually going to the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry. We invite you to come to River Bluff Dental. Dr. Palmer would go on to open River Bluff Dental in suburban Minneapolis, this video publicizing their expertise. There's many different procedures we can do. We have restorations that we can do. He became an award-winning dentist, his polished reputation filling a golden bank account, a Tony home in town, and several others around Minnesota and as far away as Florida. That financial success allowed Dr. Palmer to take his childhood interest in hunting to a whole new level, bow hunting for big game. Super slammers are the elite, the best of the best. He became good enough and had enough money to travel far enough to accomplish something only two dozen bow hunters ever have, the so-called Super Slam of North America, taking all 29 huntable species listed by the Grand Slam Club. This 2009 New York Times profile describes him as capable of skewering a playing card from 100 yards and refusing to carry firearms as a backup on bow hunts. And this is called a compound. Yes, this is a compound bow. Big game hunter Rebecca Francis understands the thrill. When you're out there, right when you take the shot, I mean, it's pure adrenaline. There's nothing like it. She lives in Wyoming, but like Palmer, has taken her shots around the globe. When it comes to hunting and the, the shots and the celebration, do you think people just don't get it? They don't get what your world is all about? I think that, that people are raised in different cultures. And people that were raised in, in an area like this is part of their life. People that have lived in cities, they don't understand it. What the heck are we looking at here? So we've got buffalo burgers, we've got bu uh, buffalo roast, we've got buffalo steaks, we've got cougar meat right here. You can eat cougar. Absolutely, and it's good. Francis says some hunters are all about feeding their families, but pretty much all of them have a boundless love of the outdoors and support conservation. We need to help people understand what hunters do for conservation, what we do for the future of wildlife. Dr. Palmer was as passionate a hunter as they come, but along the way he seems to have lost sight of some of the rules. In 2006, he was hunting black bear in northern Wisconsin. He had a permit to kill a bear in one county. Trouble is, Palmer actually shot a bear in another county 40 miles away. These never-before-seen photos obtained by ABC News show the aftermath of that expedition. As soon as the bear was killed, uh, Palmer and, and the three or so guys he was with, guides, uh, just they agreed they would lie about it. U.S. Attorney John Beaudry got involved when Palmer took that illegal bear across state lines back to Minnesota. He was lying to us. He was offering to pay, it turns out, about $20,000 to keep the others who were in the hunt to have them lie. So that's a fairly aggressive cover-up. But his friends didn't take the bait. The bear guide sang like canaries. Palmer eventually pled guilty to felony charges paid nearly $3,000 in fines, and was sentenced to a year of probation. He said he was remorseful. He said he was very sorry for what he'd done in this lie. Um, and one would hope that'd be the end of it. But it was not the end of his troubles. Back in the dental office, Palmer had been slapped with a sexual harassment suit. He settled out of court for a hefty sum without admitting wrongdoing. Yet the State Board of Dentistry ordered Dr. Palmer to undergo ethics training and other measures to keep his license. Through it all, Palmer never stopped chasing big game. He went to Zimbabwe, where he bagged a leopard. Another trip, a lion. This picture is from that hunt. That lion, not Cecil, a ghastly sight for animal rights activists, but not necessarily for Zimbabweans. You guys look at you know, animals and you think of, of them as majestic uh, you know, creatures. We don't. 
Zimbabwe native Goodwell Nzo recalls growing up fearful of lions and has a different take than Westerners whose image of the king of beasts comes from the zoo or the movies. Aslan, we need your help. We see animals as, you know, threats to us, not as cute Simbas. Not cute Simbas? Yeah. For Dr. Palmer, the lion hunt must have been so intoxicating that he signed up for another trip to Zimbabwe in 2015. What would happen next would turn Palmer's well-heeled life upside down. Yesterday, Palmer! Yesterday, but there are at least two versions of that hunt. Which one will you believe? Stay with us. When we come back, setting the trap, how Dr. Palmer's thrill of the hunt played out. These tracks are the difference between life and death for this animal. Someone and what does this photo. computer reveal about a possible cover-up? Next. It is the morning of July 1st. As the sun rises on Wange National Park, Dr. Walter Palmer is just arriving in Zimbabwe, eager for the thrill of the hunt. It costs big money to hunt big game, and in this case, the money is central to the legal questions that arise later. Palmer allegedly pays $55,000 to bag a lion, money that was supposed to cover a hunting permit, payment to the property owner where the hunt was to take place, and for guide Theo Bronkhorst. And do you feel you had all the right permits and everything was above board? I believe so. <laughs> Palmer has also repeatedly insisted he thought his expedition was totally legal and properly handled. But if they have the documentation to prove it, they haven't released it. So what went wrong? According to Bronkhorst, practically everything. The hunt was troubled from the start, set off by the most common of snafus. The airport misplaces Dr. Palmer's luggage. As the morning progresses, Cecil is roaming the wild, and the champion hunter is roaming the airport, looking for his bags, delaying their hunt. Bronkhorst claims that because of the delay, they couldn't make it to the hunting location he preferred. Instead, the party chose a closer option, a farm called Antoinette, land abutting Wangay National Park. It was a, a usual trip, and according to my client, nothing was illegal about the hunt. As the day ends, the hunt begins. Palmer and his guides set out to kill a lion. But unlike lions, they aren't stalking their prey. Nobody's examining footprints or using other tracking skills one might imagine. To me, a hunt is testing the wind, remaining concealed. You try again, you try again. That's a hunt. You're challenging yourself against the wits and the nature of that animal. Instead, he says, they use a technique called baiting, using the carcass of an animal to lure a lion into a predetermined place where they can get a clean shot. From what we know, there was a, an elephant carcass as bait. Filet mignon to a lion like Cecil. And for lions, nighttime is often dinner time. Palmer and company allegedly drag the bait behind their Jeep, leaving a trailing scent a mile from the all-important border between Antoinette Farm and the Wange Reserve. These tracks are the difference between life and death for this animal. On this side, you have a wildlife preserve where he can roam free. But take one, two steps on this side, you're on private property where Cecil can be shot and killed. The trap is now set. Bronkhorst reportedly states that a female lion approaches the bait. The hunters let her feed and wait. At around 10 p.m., a huge male he describes as magnificent approaches. It is the black-maned master of the domain, Cecil. You've brought this animal to you, um, delivered to you like a pizza. You're 40 meters away, everything is prepared. A spotlight would have come on. Cecil would have looked off the carcass into the spotlight, maybe being blinded by the light. Then, the moment that would change one life and end another. Cecil rushes off into the tall brush, Bronkhorst claiming he sensed the lion was hit, but couldn't be sure. It's at night. They don't want to follow him. 
they think, okay, we'll come back tomorrow. He's not going to go far, and tomorrow morning we're going to get him. Why wouldn't they want to follow him after shooting him with that first bow? This is a hugely dangerous animal now that's wounded. He's severely injured, and to go after him, you're at real risk. At 9 a.m. the next morning, the hunters tracked a wounded Cecil into the brush, and with one final arrow, Dr. Walter Palmer finished the line off. Bronkhorst's lawyer insists nobody knew the slain lion was Cecil. According to my client, Mr. Palmer didn't know he was shooting this, this famous lion. Certainly no. Palmer had also written, I had no idea the lion I took was a known local favorite, was collared and part of a study. But authorities have a different version of events. For starters, they say nobody got permits. There was no permit, so this is a uh, tantamount to, you know, poaching. He has said that he believes that he was on a legal hunt. Does that excuse his conduct? That's uh, not uh, enough excuse. Ignorance is not defense. And even if the hunt was properly authorized, it should never have taken place on Antoinette Farm. According to the Parks and Wildlife Authority, the farm had been declared off limits for lion hunting in 2015. Whatever really happened leading up to the kill, the immediate aftermath is not in dispute. And it's a grisly business. The hunters lop off Cecil's head and skin him, claiming their prize. They leave the body minus its head, minus its skin, lying in the sand, let the vultures and the hyenas finish that off. In a published report, Bronkhorst says that when he and Palmer found Cecil's tracking collar, they were shocked. Panicking, they removed the collar, leaving it in a tree, and later contacted authorities. Do you believe that? No, absolutely not. I, mean, I work hand in hand with the authorities. No such contact was made. Nothing. On July 4th, Palmer departs Zimbabwe. That same day, Brett Staple Camp notices something odd. Cecil's collar has stopped working. I make a mental note to catch that lion the next time I see him, because as far as I'm concerned at that point, the battery's died. But it wasn't only the battery that was dead. A couple of days later, Staple Camp hears a rumor that a lion had been killed. That tide has drowned that area, I believe. He immediately and goes to his like tracking equipment. And that's the final point near the railway line before the collar stops sending. To me, that's alarm bells ringing. Fearing the worst, he immediately calls authorities who make their way to what now might be a crime scene. It's really very important that uh, you know uh, the killers are brought to, to justice uh, because um, this is a national heritage which, is, uh, which belongs to everyone in the country. Killing any lion on that off-limits property was illegal, police say. Theo Bronkhorst and the property owner are arrested and charged with poaching. Bronkhorst and Palmer both say they didn't know they were killing Cecil. Yeah. Do you believe that? I don't believe that. Both men have means. They're intelligent. You could do a, an internet search for Wangi lion and a picture of Cecil pops up. If you're coming to Zimbabwe to hunt a lion, you do a bit of research. They knew what they were coming for. And now, Staple Camp shares with us what he believes is the key to the case, that GPS data from Cecil's collar, data which he says points to a cover-up. We get the impression someone is trying to fool us. Look at this. The tracker marks Cecil's position with a dot every two hours in the days before he was killed. The dots are tightly grouped. Afterwards, they're spread out. Staple Camp says that indicates a person, not a lion, was moving the collar. They're moving it around so it looks like the lion is alive. And now perhaps there's second thoughts. They move it one last time and destroy it in the hope that we can't track it. But we know someone is trying to, in a sense, fool with the crime scene. Absolutely. You certainly won't get this movement to there and back and there and then there. That's man. That's not an animal doing that. Someone moved it and destroyed the collar. We've never seen the collar again. This has been the final straw. Why? Sharon has seen the pictures of the once proud lion, now reduced to the shriveled skin of a hunter's would-be prize. So you've actually seen Cecil's skin. Yeah, that's terrible. He, he's, he's been wrapped up in salt, so he's, he's, it's completely shriveled up. You can hardly identify him. Yeah. This is terrible. It's disgusting. Um, it's just shameful. It's shameful what he looks like now. 
Sorry. Back in Minnesota, Dr. Palmer returns to his home and his dental practice. He's awaiting the shipment of his trophy, Cecil's head. But instead, he's going to receive the worst news of his life. The world is outraged over Cecil's death. He has the money to do it. And now, they want his killer's head on a platter. Then we should put a bounty on him. That's fine. Coming up, the hunter becomes the hunted. I'd like to see you as a trophy on my wall. Stay with us. continues with Hunter and Hunted. Once again, here's Deborah Roberts. On July 28th, the Cecil story breaks out of Africa when a controversial animal rights activist in Zimbabwe's capital Harare outs Dr. Walter Palmer as the Cecil Slayer. Well, I believe he should be brought in front of a judge. Growing outrage after a beloved lion was killed by an American dentist. International outrage over the death of a beloved lion. Walter Palmer. To say it went viral would be an understatement. Overnight, Palmer becomes arguably the most hated man in the world. This outrage over the death of Cecil the lion keeps growing. But I will call him what he is and he's a piece of Thank you. He is a heinous person. I want to see him destroyed. Is it that difficult for you to get an erection that you need to kill things? You know you're in trouble when you bring Jimmy Kimmel to tears. If you want to make this into a, uh, a positive, you can, uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I, okay, I'm good. Maybe we can show the world that not all Americans are like this jackhole here, this dentist, the top dentist. I think initially everyone felt the same thing. How disgusting this, how outrageous is this, how awful is this. What a gorgeous cat. Animal Planet's Dave Salmoni has dedicated most of his life to lions. The grander scale to me is the king of the jungle. You know, you can hear that. We that's can hear it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's two boys. When they get older, that'll be a lot scarier. Trust me. <laughs> For him, Cecil's death struck a chord. I hate that he was shot in that way. I hate that he suffered. I hate that somebody would just get a thrill out of killing him. Professional hunter Rebecca Francis says if indeed Palmer poached, he should pay. If something was done in any way, shape, or form illegally, then yes, their prosecution needs to happen. I actually heard about it because somebody emailed me and requested me for an interview to discuss it. Why? Hi. Because she's been subjected to the court of public opinion and knows exactly what he's in for. Oh, oh here's, here's a good one. You better pray that I don't ever run into you because I will kill you and cut your head off and mount your effing head on the wall. I hope you die soon. See, last spring, Frances suddenly had a target on her back after this memorable photo from her webpage was ripped by comedian Ricky Gervais. What must have happened to you in your life to make you want to kill a beautiful animal and then lie next to it smiling? In an instant, thousands were calling for Francis's blonde mane. You're one of the most hated women in the world. Does that bother you? It gets to me just because, you know, how can you not, how can you read all that all the time and not have it affect you? Her life upended, even though her hunt was completely legal. People saw it as just vile that you could lie next to this slain, undignified animal now that it's dead. It wasn't disrespect, it was to remember this experience. And there were people there ready to take the meat. They use everything even down to the tail where they take the hairs and, and make jewelry to sell it. Maybe. Still, some animal lovers can't get past these kinds of images. And for Palmer, the hail of arrows intensifies. Protesters swarm Dr. Palmer's temporarily shuttered office, even making a shrine to the fallen feline. Dr. Palmer, don't kill me. Just last week, vigilantes vandalized his Marco Island, Florida vacation home, covering his driveway with bloodied pig's feet. Does anybody have any PETA mobilizes, staging this vigil in Washington, D.C. This isn't exactly the kind of protest I associate with PETA. Why so quiet? This is a solemn occasion. Um, people have been devastated by Cecil's death. And yet, Goodwell and Zuo, a Zimbabwean, can't quite believe the outrage over an animal who until recently barely anyone in the U.S. had even heard of. Did you think it was ridiculous that people were upset about a lion that was killed? I was very shocked. How is it possible that anyone could, you know, cry or feel so sad about a dead lion? It's as if someone had killed Lassie. If the lion didn't have a name, do you think we'd have this outcry? 
Once an animal gets a name, they treat it like a human being. In African villages, Goodwill says news of a dangerous animal's death would actually be celebrated. Yay! Rebecca Francis has video to prove it. This is how villagers in Mozambique reacted after she shot a hippo there. When I took that hippo down, everyone in the village came running. They were hugging me and kissing me and thanking me. They all had their bucket and their knife and they were all cutting up that hippo. And every single drop of that hippo was utilized to that village. I also took some home and ate it that night. Proof, she says, that there's more to the story than a bloody carcass and a smiling hunter. It's a catch-22. People can't quite understand how, how you can love an animal and kill an animal. But I can honestly say that I look at wildlife the exact same way you do and everybody else does. I love animals. This hunter insists she's not only an animal lover, but also a conservationist. There has to always be population control. So when we hunt, we generally go after the oldest animals that generally have been past their reproductive years. So they're not part of the reproducing whole. But Dave Salmoni isn't swayed. Uh, These folks say that they're helping the conservation yeah, effort. Right, and I think that helps them sleep at night. Absolutely, they spend a lot of money. And absolutely, it goes to some governing body somewhere. But none of that money goes to purchasing land developing the population in a, in a healthy way, not trophy hunting. But before you judge, take a look at this place. We have 18,000 acres. Any of these animals, just like I said, they're born here, they're free. It may look like an African savanna, but this game hunter's paradise called the Ox Ranch is actually deep in the heart of Texas. Oh, we had a baby. Tony Hardin runs oh, the operation. Goodness. That's brand new. They've just happened. That a place that brings happened. over endangered animals from Africa and allows them to breed. A few hunters pay to shoot certain mature specimens, and the money allows the ranch to carry on. Hardin says his ranch and others have already saved three species from extinction. If uh, we shoot three or four or five or ten species of one mature animal out of the pasture that was born here, there's 200 babies hitting the ground. That may be true, but it certainly doesn't placate the anti-Palmer protesters. Now he's facing more than hatred. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has launched an investigation. And African officials are calling for Palmer's extradition to Zimbabwe, where he could face up to 10 years in prison if found guilty. And I understand that uh, already the processes have started, and we are looking forward for his uh, extradition. But how to extradite someone you can't even find? The hunters, now the hunted, with everyone wondering, where is Dr. Palmer? The disgraced dentist seems to have vanished. His practice shuttered, his homes vacant. Palmer has declined numerous requests from ABC News for a comment, but has publicly issued two brief statements in which he says, I deeply regret that my pursuit of an activity I love and practice responsibly and legally resulted in the taking of this lion. Tonight, his whereabouts unknown. Next, whereabouts we do know about. Those seven cubs that Cecil left behind. Is there a chance they won't survive? <laughs> what happens after the hunters leave? The repercussions of a lion hunter felt months and months after the hunter's home, drinking scotch. Now back to 2020 and Ryan Smith with Hunter and Hunted. They are the next generation, if they survive. Cecil's cubs, seven in all, and with their father now gone, their future far from certain. Are these cubs at risk? Is there a chance they won't survive? There is a chance. They're in mortal danger if a new coalition of males comes in. When a pride leader like Cecil dies, new males swoop in, <laughs> often killing cubs and mating with lionesses to establish their own bloodlines. The one chance Cecil's cubs have, his old buddy Jericho. After Cecil's death, some expected Jericho to kill the cubs and establish his own pride. But then, some clemency in the law of the jungle. The change in the wildlife is that, you know, we're seeing his friend who's still alive, who's um, looking after the cubs. They're not at risk necessarily from Jericho. Jericho's accepted them as his own. 
Oh, he has? Yeah, he's shared kills with them. They've bitten his ears and played with his tail. As far as Jericho is concerned, that's his pride. They're at no risk from Jericho. They've bonded. They have each other's scent on them. Jericho will look after them. So where is Jericho today? We've been looking for Jericho. That's Cecil's close friend and co-leader of his pride. He's been elusive. Few people have seen him, but locals say they've heard him. OK. Here we go. So you can see he's walked this way. So it's likely that Lyons, or maybe even Jericho, was here earlier today. Yeah. They say he is in mourning, rarely seen, but often heard. Jericho is up and down, up and down this boundary, calling. Not a full-throated lion roar as, you know, with all the confidence, but a quieter contact call. They just mm, mm, mm. He's not wanting to draw attention in case there's other lions around. He's just waiting for Cecil to reply. But he's realized that he's alone and he's desperately trying to find his partner. The effects of Cecil's death still being felt here. What does his loss now mean to this park? Yeah, it's bad. It's, it's not good for us. Um, we, we're just devastated, Ryan. Heartbroken. The repercussions of a lion hunt are felt months and months after the hunter's home. Drinking scotch, telling his friends about this lion hunt. There's animals and repercussions being felt back in Africa where he took that lion. So far, the Zimbabwean government has issued a partial ban on lion hunting. And soon, it may outlaw the killing of collared animals altogether. So a lion like Cecil, with a collar on him, that type of lion can't be hunted right now? It, no, you can't. Despite his agony over the loss of Cecil, researcher Brent Staplecamp has a surprising take on trophy hunting. Do you think hunting should be banned in Zimbabwe? Hunting uh, across the board, no. I think it's too dangerous to say that and to want that. He feels lions should be off limits, but he believes the revenue from other big game hunting will allow places like Wange to survive. Preservation is a luxury. In Africa, it's got to pay for itself. Otherwise, the argument for that land turning into cattle ranching or villages where people can grow a little bit of crops is going to outweigh the value of that land. There's an old adage that we use in this country, if it pays, it stays. So we need to see a return, otherwise we've got no argument for this. Hunters and anti-hunters